Well, good evening. I'd like to thank the Center for Religious Debate and Calvary Chapel Chino Valley for hosting our exchange tonight. Uh, one of the enduring legacies of Western civilization is that uh, Christians, Muslims, and others are free to have uh, discussions like this without being threatened, assaulted, or killed for what we say. I'd also like to thank Shadid for representing the Muslim position. As much as I disagree with Shadid's views, I'm always impressed when people step on stage and defend their claims in public debate, especially when we've got a topic like this one. Is Islam a threat to the West? On the one hand, we have the 7-7 bombings in London and the Madrid train bombings and the Fort Hood workplace violence and the Boston Marathon bombing and the beheading of Lee Rigby and the nearly 22,000 other terrorist attacks committed in the name of Allah since the fall of the World Trade Center 12 years ago today. On the other hand, many of us know Muslims who obviously don't pose a threat to anyone. My best friend in college was a Muslim. He's not a Muslim anymore, but if he had remained a Muslim for the rest of his life, I seriously doubt he would have become a terrorist. This past winter in New York, I got a flat tire after picking up my kids from school. Two of the lug nuts were stripped, so I couldn't get the wheel off to change it. A Muslim cab driver stopped and rescued us, took me to a service station, offered to pay him, but he wouldn't take my money. Muhammad, the cab driver, was not a threat to me or to anyone else. Two of my four sons have a genetic muscle disorder. One of their pediatricians is a hijab-wearing Muslimah. I don't think she's secretly waging jihad against disabled kids. So we have peaceful Muslims and we have violent Muslims. Some Muslims help us with our cars, other Muslims blow up our trains. Uh, one Muslim takes care of our children, another Muslim brings down a building on top of our children. It seems that one side is really, really misinterpreting Islam here. But which side? To answer that question, we have to turn to the Muslim sources. And when we examine the commands of Allah in the Quran and the teachings of Muhammad in the Hadith, we find that Islam poses two major threats to the West, a threat to unbelievers and a threat to women. Let's start with the threat to unbelievers. According to the Quran, Muslims are the best people in the world. In Surah 3, verse 110, Allah says to Muslims, you're the best of peoples ever raised up for mankind. Well, what about Jews, Christians, and other non-Muslims? Surah 98, verse 6. Verily, those who disbelieve in the religion of Islam, the Quran, and Prophet Muhammad from among the people of the scripture, Jews and Christians, and al-Mushrikun will abide in the fire of hell. They are the worst of creatures. Non-Muslims are the worst of creatures. Muslims are the best of peoples. It's kind of difficult to reconcile Western principles of tolerance and equality with the Quranic claim that anyone who rejects Muhammad is lower than a dog. Not surprisingly, given the utter inferiority of Jews and Christians, the Quran condemns friendship with us. As we read in Surah 5, verse 51, O you who believe, do not take the Jews and the Christians for friends. They are friends of each other. This doesn't mean that Muslims are simply to avoid us. Muslims are commanded to actively persecute unbelievers. Surah 48 verse 29 declares, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. And those who are with him are severe against disbelievers and merciful among themselves. Those who are with Muhammad, i.e. Muslims, are severe. Against whom? Unbelievers. Are merciful to whom? To their fellow Muslims. When Muhammad's forces were strong enough, Allah commanded him to fight unbelievers specifically because of their false beliefs. Surah 9, verse 73. O prophet, strive hard against the unbelievers and the hypocrites and be unyielding to them. Similarly, in Surah 9, verse 123, Allah commands Muslims, O you who believe, fight those of the unbelievers who are near to you and let them find in you hardness. Muslims are specifically commanded to fight Jews and Christians, the people of the book, in Surah 9, verse 29. Notice that every criterion for fighting us in this verse has to do with our religious beliefs or practices. Allah commands his followers to fight those who believe not in Allah nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book until they pay the jizya 
with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Muslims are commanded to fight us until we pay them not to fight us. Now, there are plenty of Muslims in the world who don't take these verses seriously. But Muhammad took them seriously. In Sahih al-Bukhari 6924, Muhammad says, I have been ordered to fight the people till they say, La ilaha illallah, there is no God but Allah. And whoever said, La ilaha illallah, Allah will save his property and his life from me. Fighting unbelievers is so essential to Islam that according to Muhammad, you cannot be a complete Muslim without visible battle scars on your body. Sunan Ibn Majah, 2763. The Messenger of Allah said, whoever meets Allah with no mark on him as a result of fighting in his cause, he will meet him with a deficiency. Muhammad didn't want to be a deficient Muslim, so one of his greatest desires was to die while fighting non-Muslims. Sahih al-Bukhari 2797, Muhammad says, By him in whose hands my soul is, I would love to be martyred in Allah's cause and then come back to life and then get martyred and then come back to life again and then get martyred and then come back to life again and then get martyred. I just want to fight and die and then come back so I can fight some more and then die again and then come back so I can fight some more and die again. Bloodshed, martyrdom, they're all I think about. Join us. We're the religion of peace. Again, there are many Muslims in the world who don't take these passages seriously. But as long as some Muslims are convinced that proper submission to Allah requires them to unquestioningly obey Allah's commands in the Quran and Muhammad's teachings in the Hadith, Islam will continue to be a threat to unbelievers. But Islam is also a threat to women, both to Muslim women and to non-Muslim women. According to Surah 2, verse 282 of the Quran, the testimony of a woman is worth half the testimony of a man. Muhammad explains why in Sahih al-Bukhari 2658. The Prophet said, isn't the witness of a woman equal to half of that of a man? The women said, yes. He said, this is because of the deficiency of her mind. The testimony of women is unreliable because women are stupid. Muhammad also claims that women are morally deficient. In Sahih al-Bukhari 1052, Muhammad says that most of the people in hell are women. He tells us why in Sahih Muslim 142. O women folk, you should give charity and ask much forgiveness, for I saw you in bulk amongst the dwellers of hell. A wise lady among them said, why is it, messenger of Allah, that our folk are in bulk in hell? Upon this, the Holy Prophet observed, you curse too much and are ungrateful to your spouses. I have seen none lacking in common sense and failing in religion, but at the same time robbing the wisdom of the wise besides you. Since women are intellectually and morally inferior to men, they sometimes need to be disciplined. Allah tells Muslim men how to discipline their wives in Surah 4, verse 34 of the Quran. Men are in charge of women because Allah hath made the one of them to excel the other, and because they spend of their property for the support of women. So good women are the obedient, guarding in secret that which Allah hath guarded. As for those from whom ye fear rebellion, admonish them, and banish them to beds apart, and scourge them. Then, if they obey you, seek not a way against them. In Sahih al-Bukhari 5825, Muhammad's child bride, Aisha, sees a woman whose husband had beaten her so severely her skin turned green. Aisha takes the woman to Muhammad and says, I have not seen any woman suffering as much as the believing women. Look, her skin is greener than her clothes. This is Aisha, the mother of the faithful, saying that Muslim women were being treated worse than pagan women. Why were Muslim women being treated worse? I suggest it has something to do with Allah's commands in here. And if you are expecting Muhammad to punish the man for beating his wife until her skin turned green, you don't understand Islam. Muhammad rebuked the woman for being a bad wife. Now if that's how the Quran commands Muslims to treat their own wives, you can imagine what Allah and Muhammad have to say about non-Muslim women. Surah 23, verses 1 through 6, and Surah 70, verses 22 through 30, say that Muslims can have sex with female captives and slave girls. The 
Quran even allows Muslims to rape female captives who are married. In Surah 4, verse 24, Allah tells his followers, also prohibited are women already married, except those whom your right hands possess. Married women are prohibited, this is about sex, unless you possess them by capturing them in battle. The historical background of this verse is found in Sunan Abu Dawud, number 2150. The Apostle of Allah sent a military expedition to Autas on the occasion of the Battle of Hunayn. They met their enemy and fought with them. They defeated them and took them captives. Some of the companions of the Apostle of Allah were reluctant to have intercourse with the female captives in the presence of their husbands who were unbelievers. So Allah, the Exalted, sent down the Quranic verse, and all married women are forbidden unto you, save those captives whom your right hands possess. That is to say, they are lawful for them when they complete their waiting period. Think about this. Muslims come up to Muhammad and say, we know we're allowed to have sex with our captives, but these women have husbands. Isn't that, isn't that adultery, Muhammad? The answer is yes, but it's okay with Allah. So according to Islam, women are stupid and immoral, and you can beat them and rape them, even if they're married, and regardless of how young they are. This is the Islam you don't hear about on PBS or the BBC. Now, since the Quran and the Hadith obviously call for the violent subjugation of unbelievers and women, why are people so confused about whether Islam is a threat to the West? The confusion comes not from the Quran or the Hadith, but from the fact that there are lots of peaceful Muslims. If Allah commands Muslims to violently subjugate unbelievers, why are there millions of really nice Muslims? For many Americans, it's almost impossible to believe that the Quran promotes violence and intolerance when most Muslims just aren't like that. But there's no great mystery here. Religion is only one of the many factors that play a role in people's lives. Your average Muslim has been influenced not only by Islam, but by genetics, family environment, friends, teachers, movies, music, and so on. If you quote a violent passage of the Quran to your Muslim neighbors, chances are they've never read it before, and even if they have, they've probably reinterpreted it. Now, if Muslims are free to ignore or reinterpret the Quran and the Hadith, does this mean that we shouldn't be concerned about what's in the Quran and the Hadith? People can just reinterpret it. Not at all, because we know, based on a variety of polls and surveys, what kind of impact the teachings of Islam have on a society as a whole. Consider some statistics. In 2004, 65% of Muslims in Pakistan, 55% of Muslims in Jordan, and 45% of Muslims in Morocco had a favorable view of Osama bin Laden. 44% of Pakistani Muslims view Osama bin Laden as a martyr. 34% of Muslims in Jordan, 49% of Muslims in Nigeria, 23% of Muslims in Indonesia, and 20% of Muslims in Egypt have a favorable view of Al-Qaeda. 31% of Muslims in Turkey say that suicide attacks against Americans and other Westerners in Iraq are justifiable. One third of Palestinian Muslims said they support the massacre of the Fogel family, which included a three-month-old baby. 78% of Pakistani Muslims support the death penalty for leaving Islam. These are the kinds of numbers when you, you see when you conduct uh, opinion polls in Muslim countries. But things aren't much better in countries where Muslims are in the minority. According to studies in Great Britain, nearly one in four British Muslims say that the 7-7 bombings were justified. 30% of Muslims would rather live under Sharia law than under British law. 68% of British Muslims support the arrest and prosecution of anyone who insults Islam. And 18% of British Muslim students would not inform police that a fellow Muslim is planning a terrorist attack. What about Islam's impact on women? In 2009, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development released a report on gender equality and social institutions. They rated countries around the world based on their level of discrimination against women. So look at the worst 12, the 12 countries with the highest levels of discrimination against women. The worst place in the world to be a woman is the Sudan. And look at the rest at the bottom of the list. Afghanistan, Sierra Leone, Mali, Yemen, Chad, India, Iran, Pakistan, Iraq, United Arab Emirates, and Libya. 11 of those 12, India is the exception, 11 of those 12 countries are Muslim-majority countries. Is that a coincidence? No, Aisha said the same thing 14 centuries ago. She said Muslim women were being treated worse than the unbelieving women. 
So Islam not only calls for the violent subjugation of unbelievers and women, it has a devastating impact on countries that absorb its ideals. And I would say that any ideology that can produce these kind of results on a global scale is undeniably a threat to the West. Thank you, Mr. Wood. 15 opening statement from Shadid Lewis. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> In the name of Allah, most beneficent, most merciful. Is the question that we're here to deal with tonight is, is Islam a threat to the West? Let us define the terms. What is the West? The West is defined as nations with a population who has an ancestry predominantly from European countries i.e. those with a, 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 a population that has a predominant white or Caucasian population. These are defined as Western nations. What is a threat? A threat is a statement of an intention to inflict pain, injury, damage, or other hostile action. A person or thing likely to cause damage or danger. Likely to cause damage or danger. The possibility of trouble, danger, or ruin? That is the question that we're here to answer tonight. Is Islam a religion, uh, excuse me, is Islam a threat to the West? Islam itself is just a set of beliefs and teachings. By itself, for example, the Quran sitting on the table can do no one any harm. In order for the Quran to take an effect, someone would have to pick it up, read it, and then attempt to implement what they read. If that person doesn't have the effect or the power to do anything to affect change, then it is no threat whatsoever. So, obviously, the Quran or Islam is just a set of beliefs and teachings. It is the Muslims that are the practitioners of Islam. So in reality, the question is, is are the Muslims a threat? Because Islam is just a set of beliefs and teachings. So, as I read from the definitions, two of the definitions are a person or thing, in this case Islam, likely... It has to be likely to cause a threat or damage to the subject, which is the West. And it has to have the possibility of trouble, danger, or ruin, in this case, to the West. Now, this question has been asked throughout the ages. Now, very quickly, let me state, as the first statement of a threat is, the intention to inflict damage. What does Islam say? Yes, my opponent gave many verses, but what are the context of those verses? The Quran clearly outlines the context when it speaks about fighting and going to the, into battle. And this is the context throughout the Quran. In chapter 2, verse 190 of the Quran, it says, Fight back against those who fight you, but be not the aggressor. That is the context throughout the Quran. Any verse you read, 929, all the other verses that are mentioned, that is the context. Because understand the context of the Quran is that the Muslims were a persecuted people. And so they were given the permission to fight back against those who fight them. But the verse is clear, be not the aggressor. Islam is not a threat to the West further because in chapter 60, verse 8, it says, Allah does not stop you from being good to those who have not tried to fight you because of your religion or driven you from your homes or, or, from being, uh, um, or taken your land or from being just towards them. Allah loves those who are just. This is the context. And I'm sure many people would say, yeah, that's common sense. Of course, that's common sense. You have the right to defend yourself if you're attacked, but if someone is not bothering you, don't leave them alone. In chapter 5, verse 8 of the Quran, it says, O you who believe, stand out firmly for Allah as witnesses to fair dealing, and let not the hatred of others towards you make you swerve to do wrong and depart from justice. Unfortunately, some Muslims are not following these things. Unfortunately, some Muslims are not following these things. They do allow things that have happened to them be, to become angry and then go and do wrong to others. 
What am I talking about? David Wood spoke about how there are some Muslims that are good and they do good things, you know? There are others that are trying to blow things up. Well, it's the same thing with the West and our own country. We have a beautiful country. There are some people here who are good to Muslims and there are some people who are killing Muslim children with their drones, with their F-16s and their Tomahawk missiles. Yet there's no cry for those in those countries whose children are destroyed by the drones. Who, are, who, don't, who want no part of these wars. But yet, imagine if your child was destroyed by a drone, some strange flying machine flying over your village from a foreign country. Would you accept that? Imagine a drone from Afghanistan flying over Los Angeles. We would be appalled by that as Americans, would we not? We would be upset. We would say, how dare these people fly these strange machines over our, vi over our city, destroying our children because they're trying to get somebody who they claim is a threat to them but then they kill our children. This does not justify, as I'm making my point, that this does not justify what people have done. But we must acknowledge where the conflict begins and where, as they say, violence begets violence. So yes, correct, there are, most, there are, there are Westerners who are very good, they give charity, they help, but at the same time, there are those who kill Muslims and bomb Muslims as well and destroy Muslims, civilians, and their children as well. So as I said, the question that we're asking is, is Islam a threat to the West? As I said, this question has been asked throughout the ages. For example, 10 years ago, there was a book written by Pat Buchanan entitled The Death of the West. And I want you to follow along with me because I'm not running away from the subject. The subject is, is Islam a threat to the West? I'm going to deal with that subject. Is it a threat? Is Islam actually, or the Muslim people actually, a physical, literal threat to the West? See, you can talk about the teachings, whether you like them or not, and I will deal with some of the things he mentioned in the rebuttal. But let me get this out of the way in the opening statement. So Pat Buchanan wrote the book, The Death of the West. Now, he didn't say Islam, but he said the death of the West. What was, what was his contention that the, death, the West was dying? He said the West was dying not because of Islam, but because, but because of the increase of people of color. Latinos, Africans, Arabs. So he said the West is going to die. It doesn't matter about Islam. The West is going to die because people of color are increasing. And we are beginning to outnumber those who are of Caucasian, European, or white descent. And because our cultures are different from Western culture, the West would be destroyed and it would die. So really, it's a bigger idea than just Islam is the threat. You go back further, we can go back 93 years, that same question, why is, ask yourself the question, as I've been telling throughout these debates, why is this question always being asked? 93 years ago, the same question is being asked, but Islam wasn't the question. Islam wasn't the reason for the question. The question now, they became more direct and they told us exactly what the problem is. There was a book written by a man by the name of Lothrop Stoddard. Now, he made it clear what the issue is. He said, the rising tide of color against white world supremacy. He's talking about the West. He's worried that the West has a threat to it, a threat to its power. But it's not Islam. Once again, the reason is what? Because there are people of color who are increasing. And your culture is different. Latinos, your culture is different. Arabs, your culture is different. African Americans, Arab, your culture is different. And if you continue to grow, you are going to destroy the West. Not just Islam, but you're, these different non-white Western cultures are going to destroy the West. Then it goes back even further. We can go back 97 years. Again, they're still asking that question. Again, ask yourself the question, why is the West worried about their power? Why are they worried what is a threat to them? So 97 years ago, another book is written by Madison Grant. It is called The Passing of the Great Race. See, back then, they, they could be more direct, and they can tell you straight out what they were talking about. The Passing of the Great Race. Once again, the subject matter is the same. There's a threat to the West. There's a threat to the West. And what is that threat to the West? Again, the increase. These people of color that are out here, a threat to the West because your culture is different than theirs. And if you continue to rise, if you get power, 
You will destroy Western culture because your culture will dominate over theirs and they will no longer be dominant. So we see these are all based upon the same concern, which is what? The loss of Western power, i.e. the loss of white Western power. So is Islam a threat to that? Do the Muslims actually have the power or are they in the position to really threaten the West in this way? Well, let's take a look. In a National Security Study Memorandum 200, dated April 24, 1974, it states very clearly, the implications of worldwide population for US security and overseas interests. The goal, to reduce populations of third world nations so the US could have access to their natural resources. So in other words, here is a, the United States is one of the most powerful Western nations. And as you see, it is proactively seeking to maintain power by what? reducing the populations of other countries. And we know the United States has the power to do so, as well as many other Western nations. For example, who are the biggest weapons makers that we know? They are all Western nations. The USA, maybe with the exception of Russia and China. Russia is number two. France is number three. Germany is number four. The UK is number five. These are the biggest weapons makers in the world. No Arab, no Muslim country comes nowhere close. How about those who have a military budget? Our own United States government has a military spending budget of $106 billion. $106 billion our nation spends on military expenditures. We spend more money on war and the preparations for war than we do on health care, than we do on social programs, than we do on education. We spend more money on war. If you were to take the nation's of the Middle East that were considered to be the most dangerous, such as Iran, Iraq, Libya, Syria. They throw in North Korea, although it's not a Muslim nation, but they throw in North Korea. North, these countries together, together, you have to put them together. They have a combined spending budget of $15 billion. You remember, the United States has 108, 100, uh, 106 billion. These countries together, combined, have only a $15 billion budget. So that means if they even attempted, even if they had such an idea that they wanted to threaten the West or even the United States, they would run out of money before they could affect any change. The United States would outlast them way beyond the, the efforts that they could make in their military expenditures. How about nuclear weapons? Nuclear weapons is a part of power and threats. Well, Russia has 8,500 nuclear missiles. The United States has 7,700 nuclear missiles. France has 300. China, 240. The United Kingdom, 225. There's no Muslim, only one Muslim nation has nuclear weapons, and that's Pakistan. They have about 90 to 110. And their missiles are aimed at India, and India's missiles are aimed back at them. Other than that, no other Muslim nation has nuclear weapons. The United States alone, or Russia alone, could destroy our entire Earth, they tell us, 40 times over with the number of nuclear weapons that it possesses. No Muslim could do that, and we're worried about asking if Islam is a threat. Our nation, and I love it, but it's nothing wrong with telling what's wrong when you want best for your nation. Our nation has a history of using these weapons before, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You might say, well, they attacked us first. Okay, good, they attacked a the military target. But we dropped bombs, too, nuclear bombs, on civilian populations, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The West has, fought, has been in power for quite a long time, actively, actively seeking domination. We can, our nation could put sanctions on other nations. Has a Muslim nation ever put sanctions upon us? Has a Muslim nation ever been able, they, probably, they couldn't even do it in the UN. And we're asking, is Islam a threat? Don't, I'm, don't get me wrong, there are Muslims out there who want to do bad things. But is that all Muslims? No, it is not. Is Islam a threat? No, it is not. As I showed you already from the teachings, please remember what I, those verses that I gave you. By the way, very quickly, he mentioned some things that Muhammad said. Here's what Muhammad really said. Muhammad said in a hadith, Bukhari, volume 4, book 52, number 266, he said, do not wish to meet the enemy. In other words, don't look forward to war. He says, however, but if you do have to meet the enemy, then be patient. The Quran, chapter 8, verse 61 says, and if your enemy, if you do get in battle, if the battle does take place and it is a war, the Quran says, and if they incline to peace, 
then you should incline to peace also and trust in Allah. Surely he is the hearing, the knowing. So the point that I gave you in all these things, and I have more to bring, is that in reality, Islam or the Muslims are not a threat. Number one, that is not their goal. But number two, Muslims are not in a position to threaten the West. They don't have the power. They don't have any nuclear missiles. They don't have the military budget that compare. They don't have drones. They don't have what the West has. It is the West that is proactively, as I just mentioned, seeking this domination. You see? It is the West that has, for the last several centuries, been dominating the world. Look at the history of our country. Look at the history of Latin America. Look at the history of North Africa and many places upon the world. The British Empire used to brag that the sun never set on their empire. Why? Because they had conquered so far and wide. Because they have been made very powerful. So is Islam a threat to the West, i.e. are the Muslims a threat to the West? No, they are not. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Now we have a 10-minute rebuttal from David Wood. Thank you, Shadid. Um, I gathered about two major points that Shadid made, um, apart from the West is bad. Um, Shadid pointed out that, the, that Islam is just a set of teachings, and these teachings can't really do much on their own. Someone has to act on those teachings, and Muslims might not be in a position to act on those with weaker militaries and, and so on. Uh, I happen to agree with his main point there, that yes, if everyone ignored the teachings of Muhammad and the teachings of the Quran, the Quran and the teachings of Muhammad would be absolutely harmless. If they're off in a library somewhere and no one takes them seriously, then absolutely not a threat to the West. So I agree with Shadid that yes, you do need people acting on these teachings, but as I showed in my opening statement when I gave the statistics, there are lots of people uh, around the world who take these teachings seriously. Shadid said, well, according to Pat Buchanan, uh, the West is dying because people of color are increasing. Well, if, if he actually said that, then Pat Buchanan would be a doofus, wouldn't he? Um, has nothing to do, that has nothing to do with the topic. If you want to say, in other words, let's take that seriously for a moment. The, the West is in trouble because of people, col uh, people of color. Well, that would just mean there's an additional threat to the West. In, in other words, if one guy's about to come punch me in my face and someone else is about to come punch me in my face, it doesn't mean that, you know, because there's this other threat, this other guy's not a threat, right? Um, so I, I don't understand the point. You could say there, there are 50 different threats to the West. Um, that doesn't mean that Islam isn't, especially when we examine what it teaches. He says, uh, do Muslims have the power to be a threat to the West? He says that uh, Muslim countries don't have powerful militaries. We have the nuclear bombs and spend much more on our military and so on. Uh, just to be clear, uh, I, I agree with that point that my, uh, my concerns about Islam have nothing to do with the military prowess of Muslim countries. Muslim uh, countries have very weak militaries. They uh, have for about a century. And so I'm not concerned about Saudi Arabia you know, sending a, their navy over and conquering the United States of America. I have no concerns about that at all. So what, what is the concern? Well, you didn't need a nuclear bomb or a powerful military to bring down the World Trade Center. You didn't need a powerful military or nuclear bombs to blow up those trains in London or in Madrid. You don't need powerful bombs to kill me. They're Muslims. Most, most Muslims I interact with are, 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 are fine and nice. Some say they're going to kill me and my family. You don't need a nuclear bomb to do that. You don't need a nuclear bomb to be a threat to me or to any of you. So the question is, is Islam a threat to me? Is it, is it, is it a threat to you? Well, I, I would say yes. If people are telling me they're going to kill me, I look up their sources and their prophet, the one they are convinced they have to believe in, said that people like me should be killed well then, as long as there are people who take that seriously and don't just put that on their shelf and treat it as a joke, then certainly, certainly Islam is a threat to me. Shadid's uh, other point was that there are peaceful verses in the Quran. And I happen to agree completely. There are some verses in the Quran that I think are great. And if those were the only verses in the Quran, if Muhammad's final marching orders were to live in peace, then I would say Islam is not a threat to the West or to anyone else. But Muhammad's final marching orders are found in Surah 9, the last major chapter of the Quran to be revealed. That's where we find, fight those who do not believe in Allah, fight those of the unbelievers who are near to you and let them find in you hardness, strive hard against the unbelievers and the hypocrites and be unyielding to them. 
So how do we reconcile the violent teachings of the Quran with the peaceful teachings of the Quran that Shadid brings up? Well, there are two basic methods. Um, there's the traditional method of interpretation that goes back to Muhammad and his companions. And there's a, there's a more modern method, a, a westernized Muslim method, where um, you seek to reconcile uh, teachings of the Quran, teachings of Islam, with Western values. Now, which one should we favor? Which one should we favor? Well, we need to keep a couple of things in mind. Uh, first, the Quran claims to be perfectly clear in its commands. Let's look at some verses. Surah 6, verse 114. Shall I seek for a judge other than Allah when he it is who has sent down to you the book fully explained? Surah 11, 1. This is a book whose verses have been made firm and free from imperfection, and they have been expounded in detail. Surah 12, 1. These are verses of the clear book. 1689, and we have sent down to thee the book explaining all things. 27.1, these are the verses of the Quran, a book that makes things clear. 41.3, a book whereof the verses are explained in detail. 57.9, he it is who sends down clear communications upon his servant that he may bring you forth from utter darkness into light. Allah says that the Quran is clear, free from imperfection, fully explained, expounded in detail. It explains all things. So when, a, when one of uh, Muhammad's followers comes along and says, well, look, the, the Quran teaches these very peaceful things here and uses that to ignore, fight those who do not believe in Allah, we have to wonder, well, why are you ignoring this perfectly clear command to fight unbelievers? Second, the Quran doesn't allow reinterpretation of Allah's clear commands. Surah 33, verse 36 claims that the only option for a true Muslim is obedience. It is not fitting for a believer, man or woman, when a matter has been decided by Allah and his apostle to have any option about their decision. If anyone disobeys Allah and his apostle, he is indeed on a clearly wrong path. You have no option but obedience if you're a Muslim, according to the Quran. According to Surah 465, a Muslim has no real faith until he has no resistance against Muhammad's decisions. The verse reads, but no, by your Lord, they can have no faith until they make you, O Muhammad, judge in all disputes between them and find in themselves no resistance against your decisions and accept them with full submission. A lot of Muslims find in themselves resistance against the teachings of the Quran. That's why they reinterpret them. But you don't get to do that. They're perfectly clear. Your only option is obedience as a Muslim. Third, even when two of Allah's perfectly clear commands contradict each other, there's no reinterpretation involved. Allah lays down the doctrine of abrogation in Surah 2, verse 106. Whatever communications we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, we bring one better than it or like it. Do you not know that Allah has power over all things? So for a Muslim, a traditional Muslim, when we open the Quran and see Surah 2, 256, there is no compulsion in religion. Lovely verse. And we turn and we read Surah 929, fight those who do not believe in Allah. The only question for a traditional Muslim is which one came last? That's the one that abrogates or cancels the former verse. And again, Surah 9, is the last major surah revealed. So that's the method that's laid down in the early Muslim sources. Muslims today do things a bit differently. They look through the Quran, hear the teachings that we like, these are the ones that line up with what we believe and our values here in the West, and we use those to reinterpret the other passages. But you don't do that. When Allah says there's no compulsion in religion, why is he completely clear there? But when he says, fight those who do not believe in Allah, he means something totally different. He doesn't mean what he says there. Allah says he's perfectly clear. The only way to reconcile these passages is to say, this one applied during this time, this one applied at a different time. You can't harmonize these passages. And traditional Muslim scholars admit this. So Shadid quoted, for instance, Surah 2, verse 190, Surah 60, verse 8, to show that Islam promotes peace and tolerance. Well, let me just quote you Tafsir Jalalain, one of the most popular Islamic commentaries in history. He comments on Surah 2, verse 190, and fight in the way of God to elevate his religion with those who fight against you, the disbelievers, but aggress not against them by initiating the fighting. God loves not the aggressors, the ones who overstep the bounds which God has set for them. So far, so good. Now keep reading. 
This stipulation was abrogated by the verse of Bara, which is Surah 9, verse 1, which breaks all, uh, which breaks all treaties. Tafsir Jalalain on uh, Surah 60, verse 8. He says, God does not forbid you in regard to those who did not wage war against you from among the disbelievers on account of religion and did not expel you from your homes that you should treat them kindly and deal with them justly. Sounds great so far. This was revealed before the, before the command to struggle against them. So how do traditional Muslim interpreters interpret these passages? They say, look, this one's telling you one thing, this one's telling you something else. Take the one that came last and that's the command to fight them. So what you find is, yes, there are peaceful verses of the Quran. There, there are verses of the Quran. I would say, wow, that's a, that's a great teaching. But those were revealed when Muhammad's a persecuted prophet in Mecca. Later, when he had formed alliances, then he allowed defensive jihad. Later, when Muhammad was the most powerful force in Arabia, that's when Surah 9 comes. You violently subjugate everyone. And that's why Islam is a threat to the West. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Now, 10 minute. Rebuttal by Mr. Lewis. Okay, all right, so here's the part where I said I'll go ahead and deal with these things here, all right? Again, well, as you heard, you didn't really hear why Islam was a threat. You just heard some teachings that he doesn't like. He admitted, he admitted that the Muslim nations were weak. It's the Muslims that practice Islam. If you admit that the Muslim nations are weak, then the Muslims don't pose a threat or Islam doesn't pose a threat to the West. You might not like teachings or whatever, but if, as you admit, they're weak, then what are you worried about? Sure, there's some Muslims who can do harm, but again, non-Muslims do harm to us as well. Here's a, you want, shall we do that? Look, I have an article here, last month in New York, two people accused of plotting to kill Muslims with x-ray weapon. Have an article here, Christian militia, the Hutari, they were arrested, thank God, by the FBI, but they were planning a terrorist attack. To do what? To start the end time so Jesus Christ could return. Here, another article, The Secret World of Extreme Militias. Many of these militias are white racists, but they also have a Christian theme about them. They want to bring about end times. They want to, they want to speed up the return of Christ. So they're preparing to do terrorist actions. I know you're going to say, well, they don't represent Christianity. We say the same thing about those Muslims. Here's another example. Alabama militia planning to attack Mexicans. Thank God the FBI caught them before they were able to carry out the attack. Another example, white supremacists caught, this, these are recent articles by the way, caught, thank God they were caught, planning to start a race war. So yeah, these people can cause threats to all of us. But the question is a threat to the West as an entirety, meaning can it destroy your culture? Sure, no, I'm not denying that, they can, that individual Muslims can do random acts of violence and hurt us, but can they pose a threat to us as the entire Western culture? He admitted, no, the Muslim nations are weak. But let me address some of these issues here. Okay, he mentioned, oh, one more other thing too. He gave all these statistics about how Muslims agree with, you know, how many agree with, um, you know, bin Laden or whatever, or agree with attacking civilians. How about you, how, not you, but how about you as American Christians? Here's a Gallup poll. The question is, how many, those who believe it is justified or sometimes justified to target and kill civilians. Amongst American Christians, 58% agree that it's okay. That it's okay, it's justified to kill civilians. That's a threat to Muslims whose countries are being invaded right now. That means many, 58% of American Christians agree with those children that I mentioned that are killed by drones. Those civilians that are killed by drones. So you want to throw statistics about Muslims? Well, let's talk about how many American Christians agree. How about Jewish Americans? 52% of Jewish Americans agree that it's okay to kill those children in Afghanistan and Yemen. That it's okay to kill those civilians in these countries. It's okay to kill civilians. Mormon Americans, they have the most. Wow, more than the, rec you know, the, the mainstream Christians. Mormon Americans agree. 64% of Mormon Americans agree. It's okay. It's justified to kill those children over there in Afghanistan with the drones, or the civilians with the drones and the Tomahawk missiles and cruise missiles. It's okay. So we can, we can throw out too. So obviously there must be a bigger problem with humanity, perhaps besides just blaming one religion over the other. But let's get to these issues here. Um, let's see. He mentioned chapter 5, verse 51, don't take friends. Actually the word is awliya. 
It means don't take as guardians. But as I showed you in chapter 60, verse 8, it clearly says, as long as they're not trying to fight you. So the context is made clear. He's right. The Quran says it's clear, and it is clear. Read the whole thing, and you'll find out. So what is it talking about? It's saying those who are not trying to fight you, don't take them as your guardians. But it says in chapter 60, verse 8, if they're not trying to fight you, if they're not trying to drive you out of your home, be kind and just to them. It is those who are trying to attack you, kill you with drones, tomahawk missiles. Don't be kind to these people. But if they're not trying to do that, then be kind and just to them. He mentioned that I have been ordered to fight. Now, Muhammad said he was ordered to fight. The scholars agree, if you did the research, the scholars say that this was in reference to the pagan Arabs. In fact, scholars say, you talk about abrogation, that this hadith was abrogated by the peaceful verses of the Quran that talk about having peace and peace treaties. Why didn't he tell you that? I'm sure by now you have to have done that research, David. We've been having these debates for quite some time. Um, what else did he, he spoke about? He spoke about the, the countries where women are safe to be at. Did you know right here in the United States, a woman is assaulted every 2.5 seconds? So right here in the West, in your own nation, you're more in danger. Every 2.5 seconds, a woman somewhere in the West or in the United States is assaulted. And you're worried about women over in Afghanistan? How about worried about, let's, let's worry about the women right here. He mentioned about wife beating and that Muhammad didn't rebuke the, re, re, rebuke the man. In actuality, yes, he did. In fact, he rebuked all men who did that. He said, those men who do this type of action, you are not amongst the best of men. You are not the, monk, the best amongst men who do these things. He talked about slave captives and having sex. That's in your Bible. The Israelites captured women, took them for themselves. David had several hundred concubines. That was warfare back then. It's in your Bible. Even the tribe of Benjamin was instructed to take women from other nations. Your Bible says that all scripture is good and useful for doctrine. Could Christians go to war and use those verses to take women? It's in the Bible. If you're condemning one, condemn your Bible. Your Bible allows taking the slave captives, the women, as captives for themselves. He said, how do you reconcile the verses? He said that these verses are supposed to be abrogated. Well, you know, again, as you know, in any religion, you can find scholars that say one thing or another. But what is the correct position about these verses? Let's read. Here's what the scholars say. Imam Tabari says in his book, Divergences of the Jurist, he says the most proper interpretation of chapter 60, verse 8, the one that I just told you about, it's okay to be peaceful with people who are not trying to fight you. He says is that God has commanded kindness and justice to be shown amongst all kinds of communities and creeds. And he did not specify by his words some communities to the exclusion of others. He says, God, Allah, speaks in general of any group that does not openly attempt to fight or harm Muslims or drive them out of their homes, and that the opinion that this kindness was abrogated by later Quranic statements makes no sense. That's the correct position. How about another? Imam Sayyuti says, specifically discusses these verses in relation to other verses of peace, patience, and forgiving. He explains that contrary to what some imams have claimed, this is not a case of abrogation. Those verses still stand and still remain. And I could go through a whole list of a bunch of others. But let me go back to now why proving why Islam is not a threat to the West further, is that there are people in our society, such as John Hagee, who has the ear of those in power in our government who have the ability to affect our foreign policy, which is one of the strongest in the world, as we know. Here's what John Hagee says. He says in his uh, prophesizing about end times, it says in this article, lobbying for Armageddon. He's lobbying for Armageddon, lobbying our government, our United States government and military for Armageddon, the Christian idea of Armageddon. He says that he ratcheted up his rhetoric with this year with the publication of his book, Jerusalem Countdown, in which he argues that a confrontation with Iran is necessary. He says, a necessary precondition for Armageddon and the second coming of Christ. In his best-selling book, Hagee insists that the United States must join Israel in a preemptive military strike against Iran to fulfill God's plan for both Israel and the West. Now, what's the difference between what he said and a Muslim who says something like that? The difference is, as he mentioned, the Muslim nations are weak. But the United States is strong. In the article, it goes on to show how many politicians, like Republicans, uh, like Michelle Mel uh, Melman and uh, presidential aspirants John McCain, Newt Gingrich, and other politicians who are in power, 
who have the ability to vote on our, power, our foreign policy and affect how our military is used. They're listening to John Hagee. They are believers in Christ. And they, ex they believe this position as well. Don't you think that's dangerous? That these people would try to have our, our government used to fulfill their end times, second coming of Christ ideology? They have more of the ability to do it than a Muslim who thinks that way. So how then is Islam a threat when we have people like this who have the ear of our politicians? And actually, when you hear the politicians speak, we hear their rhetoric sometimes. They have the power to, if they would like to, use our government, use our military to fulfill their end times, bring the second coming of Christ and Armageddon prophecy to bear if they please. Who then is the real threat? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Now we'll have an eight-minute second or counter rebuttal from Mr. Wood. Well, Shadid says that uh, I guess John Hagee is a, is a threat. Um, never, <laughs> never met anyone who was, uh, who was threatening me over John Hagee. Uh, but even if it's so, what would that have to do with whether Islam is a threat to the West? Shadid says, well, two people were arrested for planning to kill Muslims, and that non-Muslims can plan terrorist attacks. Well, then that would be a threat too, wouldn't it? We're asking whether Islam is a threat to the West. And so far, I haven't seen any reason to think that it isn't. Um, let me begin with what, what I think is an important issue, namely, uh, can Muslims be friends with Christians and Jews? I quoted Surah 5, verse 51, O you who believe, do not take the Jews and the Christians for friends, they are friends of each other. Shadid says that the word for friends here, awliya, uh, should be translated as protectors or guardians, and he interprets this verse in light of an earlier verse, Surah 60, verse 8. Uh, let me point out three quick problems with this response. First, let's go with Shadid's interpretation here. Let's go with his translation. Do not take Jews and Christians as protectors or guardians. Well, guardians like what? Police officers? Uh, doctors? Political leaders? Don't allow Christians in any of these positions. Don't allow Jews in any of these positions. Only Muslims can, uh, can have these positions. Well, I guess that would uh, uh, make things fair in society. Uh, second, Shadid's interpretation goes against the interpretation of Muhammad's own companions. Uh, including Umar, the second rightly guided caliph and one of Muhammad's closest companions. Uh, one of Muhammad's companions, Abu Musa, had a Christian scribe who worked for him. And Umar heard that there was a scribe who was doing really good work. And he said, hey, can, can, can we have him in the mosque to do some reading for us? And Abu Musa said, no, he's a Christian. And Umar, this is Umar, Muhammad's companion, said, get rid of him, run him out of the city. And he quoted Surah 551, do not take the Jews and the Christians for friends. So Shadid looks at the verse, do not take the Jews and Christians for friends, and he wants to narrow that. It's only Christians and Jews who are attacking you, who are doing something very bad. Well, you look at the interpretation of Muhammad's companions, they had a much broader interpretation. You can't have any sort of working relationship with these unbelievers. You need to get rid of them, get them out of the city based on their beliefs. This man was not attacking anyone. This man was not a threat. He was just a Christian who happened to work for a Muslim. That was too much. That was too much for him. This is Umar. So if Shadid wants to say that he is a greater authority than the rightly guided caliphs, I'd be open to hearing his case for that. Third, by saying that awliya should be translated as protectors or guardians, Shadid, I, ha I hate to say, has just committed shirk, the unforgivable sin in Islam. How so? Well, Surah 10, verse 62, refers to the awliya of Allah. And there's no problem there. In most translations, the awliya of Allah, that's the friends of Allah. Well, if now you're translating that as protectors and guardians, well, then you're saying that Allah has protectors and guardians. Allah has his bodyguards. If he has bodyguards, then he's not all powerful because there are people who are more powerful than him. And if he's not all powerful, then he is not God. So the verse is what it is. We know the interpretation. If you try and reinterpret it, you're telling us something about yourself, not about what Islam teaches. 
Let's go through a couple of these uh, passages, just because Shadi doesn't believe that Islam really teaches that you should fight unbelievers based on their beliefs. He interprets the later teachings of Islam, the final marching orders of Muhammad, in light of the earlier verses when the Muslim community uh, was either being persecuted in Mecca, and then the message was peace and tolerance, or later when they had tribes, uh, tribal agreements with, with other groups and so on, and the message was uh, only fight if they're attacking you, but these other groups that aren't attacking us, don't, uh, don't fight them. And he's interpreting the, the later verses in light of the earlier, rather than the traditional position, which is, uh, which is abrogation, whereas the later takes precedence over the earlier. But just listen to these verses, because again, Allah claims to be perfectly clear. Fight those who believe not in Allah nor the last day. What's that mean? Well, how did Muhammad interpret it? Sahih Muslim number 30, the Messenger of Allah said, I have been commanded to fight against people so long as they do not declare that there is no God but Allah. How did Ibn Kathir, Ibn Kathir considered the greatest commentator in all of history by many Muslims. How did he interpret these, uh, the, the discrepancy between the peaceful verses and the violent verses? Well, commenting on Surah 2, verse 256, there is no compulsion in religion, which is probably the most uh, peaceful verse in the Quran. He ends his commentary by saying that this verse is abrogated by passages, by verses like uh, 973 and 9123, which I quoted in my opening statement. And he concludes with this, therefore all people of the world should be called to Islam. If any one of them refuses to do so or refuses to pay the jizya, they should be fought till they are killed. If Shadid is right, Ibn Kathir really, really is misinterpreting the Quran. But how can you blame him, right? He opens up the Quran. Allah says, when I reveal one thing and it comes later than something else and contradicts it, the principle is abrogation. That's 2.106. He opens up the Quran, there's no compulsion religion. Fight those who do not believe in Allah. Which one came last? Fight those who do not believe in Allah. Okay, then I have to fight those who do not believe in Allah. Maybe I'm misinterpreting that. Well, Muhammad said he's been commanded to fight people until they recite the Shahada. We have this over and over again in the Muslim sources. And let me just give you how Muhammad's followers, his companions interpreted what Muhammad is going around saying. Muhammad had a scribe named Thabit ibn Qais, and Muhammad told him to get up and speak to a group of people. Here's what he said. We are the helpers of God and the viziers of his messenger, and we fight people until they believe in God. He who believes in God and his messenger has protected his life and possessions from us. As for the one who disbelieves, we will fight him forever in the cause of God, and killing him is a small matter to us. Why is killing him a small matter? Unbelievers are the worst of creatures. You see, how, you see how, how all of this fits together? Allah commands it, Muhammad goes and recites it, then his followers go out and say the exact same thing, and somehow Western Muslims will read all of this and say, it's all about self-defense. If this is about self-defense, then Allah should not be claiming that he's clear, because he would be the least clear communicator in all of history. And ju just think about an example here, right? There's a little thing going on in Syria now, right? Suppose President Barack Obama steps out tomorrow and says, Military, fight those who believe in Allah and Muhammad. He walks away. The military goes out and starts fighting Muslims. And then suppose Barak comes back later and has to explain himself and he says, when I said fight those who believe in Allah and Muhammad, I really meant fight a particular group who was attacking people and I was only referring to the Assad regime and since he was attacking people and he believes in Allah and Muhammad, I was only talking about him. Would anyone think that's acceptable? No. The general rule is if you're talking about attacking and killing people, you need to be pretty specific. And according to Shadid, Allah just isn't. So Allah, who claims to be perfectly clear, just isn't as clear as we would demand from any leader. Now, Shadid uh, gave a couple of responses. I'm almost out of time. Um, he said, women are raped in the US, so why am I complaining about the Muslim world? Well, we acknowledge that it's wrong, right? You can't do that if the commands of the Quran are true. So you cannot say that they're wrong if you really believe in the Quran. He says, wife beating. Muhammad uh, did rebuke the wife beater by claiming that the wife beaters aren't the best of men. Read the story. The woman comes in, her skin is green. Muhammad rebukes her. How dare you? How dare you act like that around your husband? Oh, you had to, he, he, it was your fault. It's not what we find. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Mr. Lewis, eight minutes. Thank you. Yes, read the story and you will see that Muhammad rebuked the man and said, all men who are like that man are not the best amongst men. 
And there are many other hadiths as well that go along with that, where he reiterates the same thing. Those who treat their women badly, you're not the best amongst men. There are many go along with that. So yeah, read the story. So, so far he's saying that, so far he still hasn't heard why Islam is not a threat to the West. Well, you haven't told me why it is. You're just telling me, you, you keep, you're, it sounds like you're giving the class a anti-Muslim lesson, based, that rather than telling us how Islam is a threat. You already admitted that the Muslim nations are weak. I'm talking about the literal threat. He's trying to give you less, a supposed lesson on why Islam is bad, but we're talking about the threat. So even if, the, even if the, what he said was true, which is not, and Islam is bad, he admitted the Muslim nations are weak. The Muslim people are weak. Therefore, how can they be a threat to you? How can they change your society? How could they oppose so, all these horrible things that he spoke about you? How could they change your society? An attack here and there, that's a harm. He, we're talking about a threat to the West as a whole. Anybody can be a threat to you as right now. You can go outside. This is L.A. I heard about L.A., the gangs, Crips and Bloods. Anybody can be a threat to you. But are the Crips and Bloods, for example, a threat to the United States? Can the Crips and Bloods take over the country? No, they're a threat in a minor sense, but are they a threat to the entire country? Could the gang leader of the Crips take over? No, we know he doesn't have the power to do that. So this is what I want you to understand in that context. Is Islam a threat in that way? I'm not denying that Muslims can harm you or me, but are they a threat to the West? Do you understand what the West is? It is the entire nations of the West, Canada, America, Britain, France, Spain, Germany, etc. Is Islam, the Muslim people, the Muslim countries, are they a threat in that way? We already said, we already proved they don't have the nuclear weapons. They don't have the military budget to do so. We could destroy, and I mean we as Muslim, we in America, our country. Matter of fact, we could do it without the West. The United States by itself, if we wanted to, could destroy the entire Muslim population of the earth. How is Islam a threat? Regardless of the teachings, whether they're, whether they're good or bad. But let's go ahead and deal with some of these teachings things that he spoke about. He said about the positions of the guardians. <clears throat> What does this mean here about the position of the guardians, not to take them as your guardians? Because this is talking about the Muslim nations as a whole. For example, right now, let's take a look right now in Syria, right? Let's take a look at Syria right now. Muslims fighting Muslims in Syria, right? Or secularists, Assad's regime is secular. Now, Muslims, they said there's been gassed. But because the Muslims are not relying on themselves, they're sitting back waiting for America to do something. I speak as an American Muslim. I don't think that we should get involved in Syria. Let the Muslims handle that in the, in the Middle East. I'm sure you would agree with me. It's a horrible, yes, that chemical weapons are used, but this is an example of taking others as your guardian because now your hands are tied. You sit back and you do nothing. The Arab League is doing nothing. Why? Because they're taking others as their guardians. This is the context that it's in. Not that I can't take a police officer and call him for help or go to the government for assistance or any of this, of this nature. This is talking in the context of nationhood. He says something about Umar. Well, who knows better if Umar said that, which I doubt. But look, the Quran already said, chapter 60, verse 8, Allah is God, not Umar. The Quran said, if they're not trying to fight you or trying to drive you from your homes, treat them kindly. He said about Muhammad's marching orders, he goes to the, I have been ordered to fight. Well, let's see what the scholars say about that. See, now if, you're a true, if you've truly been studying our works, then you would have, he would have known this. Here's what the scholars say about that hadith. He says, Imam Abu Hanifa and his legal school limited this hadith only to the Arabian idolaters. Imam Malik and his legal school, school limit this only to the Quraysh back 1,400 years ago. Doesn't apply to you or anybody today. He limited it to them. This also is Ibn Batil and in the teachings of Bukhari. Another imam, Imam al-Nawawi, in his commentary on the 40 hadith, speaking of this very hadith, he says the majority of the scholars say that this refers to the Arab polytheists. Another scholar, Ibn Hajar, states that this hadith, the one where it says that Muhammad was supposedly ordered to fight people until you accept or die, he said this hadith was abrogated by what? By later rulings concerning peace agreements. That hadith was abrogated by Quranic rulings of peace 
agreements. And even if it wasn't, they said it was only a reference to the pagan Arabs 1,400 years ago. He said that one of Muhammad's followers supposedly stood up and said, yeah, we're ordered to fight you till you die. Let's see what the Quran says. In Islam, the Quran is the highest source. And we have a teaching in Islam that if you read something from the other sources in Islam and it contradicts the Quran, then you leave that source and you go with the Quran. Why? Because the Quran is like our, our Bible to you. It is our highest source. So it overrides anything. So if I read something from a scholar, from some other source, and it contradicts what the Quran says, then I will negate what that source says and I will stay with the Quran. So if that's what he said is correct, that someone stood up and said, oh yeah, we're ordered to fight you till you die. But that's not what the Quran says. What does the Quran say? Our highest source. The Quran says in chapter 42, verse 48, it says, but if they turn away, meaning they turn away from Islam, you reject it. Does it say fight them and make them, will kill them then? No. It says if they turn away, it says we have not sent you as a guardian over them. Your job is only to give them the message. Not kill you. Give you the message, you jack. Hey, I gave you the message. Go. Another one. <clears throat> Chapter 6, verse 66. It says, your people have rejected it, even though it is the truth. Say, I am not appointed as a guardian over you. You reject it? Okay, I'm not, I'm not your guardian then. Go. No, no, no. Well, kill them anyway. doesn't say that. Here's another one where God asks Muhammad a rhetorical question. In chapter 10, verse 99. He says, and if your Lord had pleased, surely all those who on earth would have believed, all of them, Will you then force men to believe and become, and become believers? He's asking them a rhetorical question. He's saying, look, I'm God. If I wanted to, I could make the entire earth believe in me, but I don't choose to do that. Will you then make people believe? Will you then force people to believe? You understand? He's God. He's talking to the prophet. He said, look, I'm God Almighty. I have the power to make the entire earth believe in me, but I haven't done that. Will you then force people to believe Muhammad? In other words, you can't do it. And he doesn't want him to do it. That's what the Quran says. You see? That's what the Quran says. If I wanted to right now, I can go and quote Martin Luther, what he said about Jews. I can quote some of your past Christian scholars and things that they said horrible about other people. You would tell me, Shadid, well, that's Martin Luther. We follow Christ. Well, I'm saying the same thing. Well, David and everybody in the audience, well, yeah, those are some other sources, but I follow the Quran. I follow the highest source, what the Quran says. This is what the Quran says when people turn away. It doesn't say, well, go ahead and kill them. It says if they turn away, then your job is only to convey the message. If they turn away, you are not appointed as a guardian over them. If they turn away, that's not your job to do so. You see? So this is what Islam teaches. So is Islam a threat to the West? No. Lastly, I will say that where I come from in Virginia, we have a military base, and we have NASA Langley. And my masjid, many people who are Muslim, they work at NASA. My point, oh, okay, I'm sorry. My, very quick, my point is that they are trying to benefit our society. The Muslims are trying to benefit, not harm it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. And now we have uh, the closing statements from each of them. Five minutes. Well, I really like Shadid's version of Islam. Uh, but Shadid, I love you and respect you too much to let you go on thinking that this is an accurate reflection of Muhammad's teachings. It's just not. Right? This method of interpretation in long ages past where you say, who cares what Umar says? Who cares what this other person says? I reject all of the, I will, I will reject these companions and I will just reinterpret what they said and say they're wrong based on, uh, based on what I believe about the Quran. You could die in certain uh, periods of Islamic history for saying that sort of thing. The traditional Muslim method of interpretation, right? according to Muhammad, the first three generations of Muslims are the best generations of Muslims. He said that. Best generation is his generation. Next best is the next generation. The next best is the next generation. Um, so if you're a Muslim today and you want to say, you know, what did this verse of the Quran mean? You're supposed to go back to Muhammad, his companions, the caliphs, the early caliphs and so on, and say, how did they interpret this? Because I'm looking at this in the 21st century and I need to know how they interpreted it because they learned it from Muhammad, they saw it exemplified in his life, they were the ones who saw how he acted on it, and that's the interpretation I'm going to go with, whether I like it or not. Shadid doesn't, uh, doesn't like that view. Don't take the Jews and Christians for friends. Shadid throws Umar under the bus. Umar said how he interpreted that passage. You have a Christian working for you. Get rid of him and run him out of town. He's a Christian. 
Don't you read Surah 5, verse 51? Shadid, well, Umar's wrong because an earlier revelation of the Quran said something different when Muhammad had alliances with non-Muslims. Later, at the time uh, of the rightly guided caliphs where they'd been commanded to violently subjugate unbelievers, didn't apply anymore. That's Umar's interpretation, but Shadid, again, goes to the earlier verses. Um, I quoted Thabit ibn Qais, Muhammad's scribe and spokesman, who got up and said that because Muhammad told him to get up and say it. And he said, we're Muslims, we're fighting you until you believe in Allah, and killing you is a small matter to us. Shadid says, well, so what? That's not what the Quran says. Really? He's just going to throw all of Muhammad's companions under the bus and say, they got it wrong, they didn't know what they're talking about. Uh, Ibn Kathir didn't know what he was talking about. Muhammad apparently didn't know what he was talking about because he said he'd been commanded to fight people until they recite the Shahada. None of these people know what they're talking about. Who knows about Islam? 21st century Muslims living in America. That's the real authority on Islam. And it's just not supposed to be that way. Shadid says that Muslims aren't powerful enough to be a threat. The method of Al-Qaeda is called death by a thousand cuts. Death by a thousand cuts. We're going to keep, we're going to keep these little cuts, cut, 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 and you'll eventually bleed to death from all these little cuts. Brilliant strategy if you don't have a powerful military. Doesn't mean it can't be successful. And so where are you getting this method from? Where are they getting that method from? Read your Muslim sources. Now, we have two different views of Islam here tonight. Um, according to my view, when Allah says something, he means what he says. He says what he means. So if he says, fight those who do not believe in Allah, fight the unbelievers who are near to you, let them find in your harness, don't be friends with Jews and Christians, wife gets out of line, beat her into submission, he means what he says. You don't reinterpret that, and that's what Islam is. If that's the case, then Islam is a threat to the West because you have 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. Many of them don't take those teachings seriously, but if you're dealing with the sort of percentages I gave in my opening statement, 20, 30, 40 percent who support groups like Al-Qaeda, that is a threat. The alternative is that Shadid is right. If Shadid is right, I want to say Islam is still a threat. Why? Because Allah just can't say what he means. Even his own, Muhammad's own companions didn't understand what Allah meant. And Muslims marched out. They marched west, and they conquered everything up until they got to Europe. They marched east. They conquered things until they got to India. You don't do that by self-defense. You don't conquer that much territory by self-defense. And so if Shadid is right, and Allah really meant live in peace with everyone, just fight in self-defense, his followers did not get that message. His greatest interpreters did not get that message. The greatest Islamic scholars did not get that message. And so if Shadid is right, Allah is just a horrible communicator. He means well but he has some sort of cosmic Tourette syndrome where he wants to say peaceful things and the wrong words keep coming out. He just ends up saying the most violent and tolerant things he can possibly say. Doesn't mean it, but some of his followers think he does mean what he says, and that makes Islam a threat. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Now the last uh, five minutes closing statement from Mr. Lewis. Okay, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> He said I used the wrong method of interpretation. I, did I not read the scholars that refuted what he said? I read the scholars that refuted what he said. So I'm not using the wrong interpretation. You're giving us the anti-Muslim interpretation. You want to read these things the way you want to read them and say what you think these people say. But I gave you what the Islamic scholars said. Those weren't modern scholars that I mentioned that said that those verses were not abrogated. Those were classical Islamic scholars that said those verses are not abrogated, that Muslims are still to be peaceful and kind to all communities. That has not been abrogated. He said about rejecting Umar and companions and things of this nature. No, I'm not doing that actually, because I already told you what the Quran says. You would have to verify that Umar actually said that. I don't think Umar would say that because I don't know, I don't think Umar would contradict the Quran. So you would have to verify that what he's telling you is an authentic narration. You would have to verify this. So any Muslims who hear this, no, I'm not rejecting Umar as, 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 as one of the companions or the companions. What I'm saying is that I know what the Quran says. In Islamic history, Umar was a righteous Muslim. So uh, being a righteous Muslim, it doesn't make sense that Umar would totally contradict the Quran. Chapter 60, verse 8 clearly said, if they're not trying to fight you, treat them with kindness. We'll say, hey, that's a, that's a, you got a Christian worker for you? We'll run him out of the country. Does that sound like what Allah just said? 
Then the law say if, they, if they're being kind to you, if they're not trying to fight you, be kind and just to them. Hey, you're not a, what, you got a Christian working for you? You got a Jew working for you? Get that guy out of here, man. He doesn't deserve to be here. Does that sound like justice to me? So I'm not rejecting Umar. I'm saying I, can't, I don't think Umar said that because Umar was known as a righteous Muslim. He was a believer in the Quran. The Quran said treat them good as long as they're not trying to fight you. So I don't think Umar would do that. That's what I'm saying. So Muslims, as you hear this, I am not rejecting Umar. I'm saying I don't think Umar would say that because Umar was a righteous man. He believed in the Quran. The Quran instructs righteous and, and kindness to those as long as they're not trying to fight you. Same with any other companions. They would have not disobeyed the Quran so blatantly like that, is what I'm saying. Same with the thing with Muhammad's supposed spokesman. Muhammad didn't need no spokesman. Muhammad spoke himself. He was the messenger of Allah. And I told you already what the verses told Muhammad. So now you want me to sit here and think that Muhammad would allow a man to sit up and totally contradict the Quran? I could read over a dozen verses where Muhammad is told, if they turn away, your job is only to give the message. If they turn away, your job is only to give the message. If they turn away, you have not been appointed as a guardian over them. If they turn away, you have not been made a ruler over them. Over a dozen verses. Now you want me to believe that Muhammad would sit quietly and let a man stand up and contradict what was, what was told to him in Quran? No, I don't think so. So who's the real authority? As I already showed you, the real authority is the Quran. I did not speak for myself. I gave you scholars that refuted what David said. I showed you exactly what the Quran says. And again, he mentioned these stats. Again, if, though, if you want to go with the stats, then the Muslim people of the world should be just as afraid of you based on the stats that I gave of how many Christian Americans and Jewish Americans believe that it's okay to murder innocent civilians. Then Muslims should be just as afraid of you then. So again, is Islam a threat to the West? As I showed you, no, it is not. Because number one, the teachings don't call for that. Number two, he admits the Muslim people are in a weak position. Number three, I showed you that the West is proactively seeking to maintain its dominant power that they've had for the last several hundred years. So therefore, Islam is not a threat. I am not your enemy here as, as a fellow American. The other Muslims are not either. Even in other places in the world, we've seen pictures of Muslims holding up signs in Egypt saying that they don't like Obama, but America good. You know what they mean. They mean they understand that it's the, that it's the policy, but they love you and like you as American people. Right? We've seen those signs. I don't know, but look it up. I've seen the signs where Muslims in Egypt are holding up signs. They don't like the American policy, but they like America, or they like Americans. And you'll find that is the case with many Muslims around the world. It is the foreign policy that people are upset about. It is the drones. And I think we need to speak up about this. You always want the Muslims to speak up about when a terrorist attack uh, uh, takes place. Well, then we need to hear your voice, too, when Muslim children are killed by drones. Do you know, alone this year, 174 Muslim children have been killed by drones. Have any of you cried about it? Have any of you spoken out about it? We want to hear your voice, too. You want us to talk? We want you to talk. Speak about those children. 174 Muslim children have been killed. How many of our children have been killed by Muslims? That many? That many? That many? I'm talking about the children. You see? Well, then let's cry together for all the children, not just ours, for theirs too. Thank you.